Hi, my name is uh, Renier Vanderly. My call sign is uh, W6WYN. My QTH is in Temecula, Southern California. And I want to welcome you to this presentation where I want to share details about my project that I recently did. Uh, and I made a, a magnetic loop antenna uh, for higher power with an alternative capacitor. So uh, if you're interested, uh, tune in and uh, let's get started. So when you are looking into uh, antennas, uh, you'll probably find uh, descriptions of a magnetic loop antenna one day. And uh, if you look at how to build such an antenna, you know, it comes to mind that it's actually relatively simple. It's a single turn coil, uh, which acts as the antenna uh, and it's tuned with a tuning capacitor and you couple power in or out of that antenna using a small coupling loop. Now there are a couple of commercial products available. Uh, they range between $500 and $3,000. Uh, we're trying to build something that is higher end uh, with our own means. And uh, you know, I give you an indication about the project cost here, uh, which could be plus minus depending on what components you have and how, how elaborate you want to make it. So uh, in order to make this antenna, I came up with initial plans. Always good to have some, some sticks in the sand when you get started. So I had on my wish list that I wanted to have higher than 100 watt capability. It needed to be tuned over multiple bands. Uh, I want to operate it safely, so I need remote tuning. I want to have relatively good performance, keeping in mind that this is a compromise antenna, of course and it should be easy to use in the field. So uh, by default, we're using a variable vacuum capacitor, uh, which is expensive, it's big, heavy. You need to order it online usually, and uh, hopefully it will uh, arrive without breakage. Uh, and it's, it's made often made, made in Russia. So um, Having that in mind, you know, especially the cost was something I was concerned about. So I was looking for an alternative solution. Now, before we go into the more in the more detail, I want to share this uh, online calculator, which I thought was very helpful for this project, which is from uh, VK3 CPU. Uh, the link to his uh, website is at the lower part of this slide. But it, basically, it allows you to look through all the, the values when you uh, are looking at uh, uh, different forms, like different sizes of diameter, different uh, loop diameters, uh, different capacitors, different power levels. All that can become pretty complicated, but you know this website basically shows it in one graph. So what you can see here, for example, and this is what I used as you know uh, my my kind of like starting points. I wanted to have a one meter diameter loop. I wanted to uh, run at least 250 watts, and I assumed that my capacitor would be a 100 picofarad maximum. So now you can see with the, with these with this input, I I have a pretty good idea what I'm up against. So. Uh, you can see that, for instance, the efficiency of such a product uh, would be you know, uh, detrimental or you know, mediocre at least at uh, 10 megahertz and uh, actually pretty good compared to a dipole uh, in the 21 and 28 megahertz range. So I kind of lowered my expectations to be able to cover 10 megahertz. would be great if I could do it but I would not expect too much performance in that range, but you know, on 14, 21, 28, 24, even uh, 17 megahertz, I, I would expect a decent performance. Then uh, when I look at the capacitor, uh, I need a capacitor that is at least 210 uh, kilovolt, which is actually when you're uh, looking for such a, a capacitor, a vacuum variable capacitor, you see that you're in the upper range of what's available commercially or on eBay on the second hand market. So um, that capacitor, if we find an alternative for it, would be a very interesting topic. And that's what we're going to discuss. So 
I went back to the early beginnings of, uh, of electronics components and uh, the capacitor was actually invented in 1742 by Professor Peter van Muschenbroek. Um, and he did that invention in the city of Leiden and that's why this device is called a Leiden jar. So you can see uh, it's a very simple device like a capacitor actually is. It's uh, two conductors separated by a glass jar and the, the, induct the conductors are uh, made of a metal foil, one on the inside, one on the outside, and uh, the glass is the dielectric. So if a charge builds up between the two plates, the two uh, electrodes, the dielectric the glass keeps them separate. Uh, this capacitor is, uh, has about one nanofarad capacitance, and it can hold a static voltage of between 20,000 and 60,000 volt. So this was a great um, uh, starting point for me, say, hey, if we take a glass jar, can we make a tunable capacitor uh, using that concept and use that for a MacLoop antenna? Another thing that uh, was interesting and was really helpful in this, in this project was uh, remote tuning using an Arduino based uh, product or project. Uh, which was developed by a Spanish uh, radio amateur, uh, Echo Alpha 7 Hotel Victor Oscar. And uh, he was so kind to uh, publish his uh, design on, on the internet. So uh, it's basically an Instructables uh, uh, article that you can uh, see the link uh, of uh, at, the down, at the bottom part of this slide. So it allows you to build something that is easy to build, uh, minimal wiring because the red printed circuit board that you see on this picture actually fits exactly on a standard Arduino board. So that, that is easy and uh, the, the code uh, can be copied and pasted and then programmed into that Arduino board, which is already uh, pre-programmed uh, or at least you know, it's, it's all cut, copy and paste. So uh, apart from making slight adjustments like my call sign at the startup screen, uh, it's ready to go. So it's very easy to copy. So that, that solved for me the issue of, okay, uh, the need for remote tuning and how to do it. So here you see a first uh, concept uh, design using the, 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 the Leiden jar MacLoop antenna, number one. So I used uh, borosilica glass, which is a, a lab beaker, a glass uh, lab beaker made of pyrex uh, glass. I found that uh, I could get um, up to 50 picofarad with this. Uh, and uh, the way of tuning is by having a 180 degree. So the inside capacitor uh, is not uh, a full coverage of the inside of the jar but it's uh, just half of it. And by rotating that, that half of it, you can uh, basically uh, tune between 10 picofarad and 50 picofarad. Or in this case, yeah, so, so once you, you reduce it in size, you have, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm strip my mind. So, so basically what you find is when you use uh, glass, which has um, a dielectric constant that is pretty high, around four to five, uh, then you get uh, a maximum of 50 picofarad with this setup. If you replace the, the, the glass jar with a Teflon jar, which has a lower dielectric value uh, constant, uh, you get roughly half of the capacitance value when, when the plates are uh, totally overlapping. Now what I also did for the remote uh, control was I used a stepper motor and this is a, a modified uh, a motor that is very common and a very low cost. And it has a, a big advantage that it has a, a gear, a reduction gear built in. So uh, you can basically do a 180 degree rotation in 1000 steps, which really helps fine tuning. So the first results were good. Um, we were, I was able to get um, a contact with, uh, with uh, New Zealand on the first, on the first day. 
Uh, it tunes very nice. It gives me uh, excellent uh, SWR. And uh, unfortunately, because of the, the, uh, the glass and the Teflon material, uh, the capacitance, capacitance range was limited, so it was also limited in frequency range. I could, I could basically uh, tune between 21 and 28 megahertz, which is by itself not bad. It's just that I wanted to have more, and at least I wanted to have the 20 meter band as well. I also noticed once I started uh, uh, gradually increasing power that the SWR started to uh, act up. And uh, when I inspected the glass jar, I, I saw to my surprise that there was uh, damage in the glass, which you can see here also in the picture. Also, when I used a Kapton tape as uh, isolation to keep uh, everything in place, you can see that there was arcing damage there as well. So uh, my first thought was that uh, the dielectric loss at uh, HF frequencies in the glass was too high. Uh, that would cause heating and uh, basically uh, uh, that would damage uh, the, the glass because of local heating and that would punch through the glass as you can see in the, in the picture. Now this is heat resistant glass uh, so used for laboratory work uh, but it still was not enough. So uh, assuming that uh, the electric loss or the, 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 the tangent the loss tangent of the material, the dielectric material, was the root of the cause. I changed the glass for something that has a, a much lower loss factor, which is Teflon. So uh, this tested OK, uh, up to 250 watt. Now the other issue was still that I had a limited frequency range, and changing from glass to Teflon only makes the, the, the frequency range or the capacitance range lower. So this didn't it did help with the arcing and the, and the, and the problem, but uh, it, it caused another problem was, uh, that was that the frequency range was, was reduced. So I made a bigger one, uh, and you can see the picture here. Now, uh, the previous uh, size of the jars was 250 milliliters. This is a half a liter, 500 milliliter jar uh, made of Teflon. So you see on the top, uh, the outer, the outer uh, 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 part of the, of the capacitor and then on the inside, the lower side, you see actually uh, the part that can move in and out. In this case, uh, I have a, a stepper motor which has, uh, is driving a worm wheel kind of a contraption which slowly moves the inner capacitor place in and out. And uh, with a stepper motor, I can control in steps and I can count the steps. So basically I have a, a, a table that, that lists the tuning frequency versus the step count. Now here uh, I had um, excellent, excellent SWR as well. And because of the war mule, I have more steps so I can find more, do, do more fine tuning. I actually have 8,000 steps. And the good part of this, this kind of setup is that I can also step in half steps quarter steps or even one, one eight steps, uh, increasing the number of steps even more, but that would slow down the tuning process. So I think 8,000 steps is kind of like the, the, the right, the, the sweet spot where you, know, where you need to make a trade off between uh, uh, accuracy of, of your, your tuning versus uh, the time to tune or move to a certain position. So now I can, I can tune between 10 and 28 megahertz. The, 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 the capacitance is uh, seven between 100 picofarad. Now here we also noticed that uh, once I started stepping up the power, I noticed when I did a long CW signal, let's say a couple of minutes, that there was a breakthrough somewhere. And here you can see uh, the damage, the physical damage that was done to the Teflon. Um, and you can also see that the point where this happened, which is easily identified here, uh, actually coincided with the top of this capacitor plate and the underside of this capacitor. So this was at the point where the overlap was minimal. 
And this is what I, I try to explain in this little picture here. You see the outer capacitor plate, the dielectric material, which in this case is the Teflon, and then the inner capacitor plate. And at a certain tuning frequency, um, where you have minimal overlap between the two plates, you have still the maximum power transfer going to a very small area of dielectric material, which is here. So in the case of um, using Teflon, which has a lower loss than glass, uh, we still get, and uh, I, I use some calculation here to calculate what the dielectric loss is and, and, the, and the power uh, of the dielectric loss. So at 21 megahertz, uh, we have this point because this, this breakthrough, this damage happened at uh, testing at 21 megahertz. And this is where you know, there's minimum overlap between the two plates. So uh, the loss, calculated loss in that, in that uh, dielectric medium, which is Teflon, was 6.4 watts, which is not, what, not much. And uh, that, that is calculated at uh, a power of 250 watts. So that's 3% loss, which is totally acceptable. But unfortunately, uh, this means that the Teflon here heats up to 500 degrees centigrade, which is way beyond uh, its melting point. So this is not helpful in the sense of this basically is the mechanism uh, that causes the defect of the capacitor. So alternatively, uh, you could use another material. So glass and regular glass is actually not very usable uh, for this application because the loss is too high. Uh, the, the Teflon by itself has low loss, but the loss is still enough in a very small area to cause uh, a heating uh, beyond the 300 degrees maximum temp temperature uh, for Teflon. Like in this case, it was 500. So if you run this for about one minute, it's guaranteed to break at a certain point. If you use a single sideband or very short um, uh, uh, transmissions, uh, you, you may be able to get away with it. On the other hand, if you are tuning at different frequencies, so if this plate, for instance, is moving away from this, then this area gets larger and you, you basically distribute the dielectric loss over a larger area, which causes low, lower heating. If you have the, the plate number two and plate one completely covering each other, completely in parallel, like at the lowest tuning frequency, it, it, you have the biggest area of dielectric material that, that basically uh, handles the power transfer uh, and you don't have heating problems either. So the heating problems are only at one specific point, which is when these areas are very small. So uh, another, another way of uh, dealing with this, I, uh, I reduced the plate size with 50% on the inside uh, capacitor side. Now I can tune between, not between 10 and 28 megahertz, but I can still tune between 14 and 28, which is, which is good enough. And then uh, the capacitance uh, will be between seven and 50 picofarad. So I, I use this to test at 100 watt output. 100 watt output is actually a pretty safe range. So where you have uh, commercial uh, products available that can do uh, 20 watt uh, uh, peak envelope power, this, this product can do 100 uh, watt uh, easily uh, and continuously. Uh, even with the limits that we were just talking about, it's just that when you try to test it to 250 watt or 200 watt and more higher, you get into this range where you cannot exceed, you cannot get to high power at the point where you know these these uh, where the the dielectric uh, area is actually very small because that's where you get the heating. So uh, talking about results uh, with this uh, antenna on my balcony uh, and 100 watt, uh, I could easily get Europe or not Europe but uh, the whole of the U.S. and Asia. So you you can see here the ranges of the contacts that I made in one weekend. So there were a lot of contacts here on the, on the short range. There were uh, contacts at 6,000 miles and even contacts at 9,000 miles. So this is pretty, pretty decent for uh, a compromise antenna that I just put on my balcony for testing. 
So uh, with that, um, I thank you for, uh, for your attention and uh, I hope this was uh, interesting and uh, an inspiration. Uh, when we're thinking about uh, uh, the ideal uh, solution, which I have not tested yet, but I'm thinking that based on what I know and, and the, the, the theoretical calculations that I did, um, I think that uh, quartz glass is the ideal solution if you really want to make uh, a QRO type of uh, antenna, Mac loop antenna, using the Leiden glass capacitor. Um, the problem with uh, the quartz glass is that there's a wide price range. Uh, US companies sell them for around $300 for a 250 milliliter kind of jar. Uh, there are Chinese companies that offer them for way less, but then the question is, um, often they confuse the pirate glass <coughs> with, um, with quartz glass. <coughs> and the pirate glass, of course, as we know, doesn't work. So you need to be very careful if you find a cheap alternative for a quartz uh, and it looks uh, you know, attractive, just make sure that it is quartz glass and good quality quartz glass. So with that, I thank you for uh, your attention. I wish you a great uh, rest of your conference and uh, feel free to reach out to me for more questions if you want. Thank you. Okay, Rainier, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, Bob, I'm hoping uh, that you finally uh, were able to see something. I'm thinking that you probably uh, joined within the first 30 seconds. Uh, there's a little bit of delay between uh, when we hit the uh, streaming and it's actually seen on the VFARES platform. Thank you, David. Now, one of the things that I noticed, uh, Rainier, is that your uh, your loop was actually, I believe, coax, correct? Uh, yes. It wasn't uh, copper tubing like you see sometimes. Yeah, I used a, a 10 foot uh, 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 cable, like LMR, LMR 400, which oh, is okay. relatively stiff. But even LMR uh, 400 tends to sag a little bit. So when you looked at the picture, you saw that I, I used a little uh, bamboo rod to keep the, the shape uh, a little intact. But even when it's drooping, uh, it doesn't, at least I didn't notice that it affected the, the performance. So it doesn't need to be a, a perfect circle to, to uh, work. Well, that's good to know. You don't have to uh, go nuts on it. Um, okay. Uh, Bob, good to see that you did get in eventually. <laughs> yeah. uh, very good. Okay, uh, have you considered uh, a series transmitting capacitor in order to reduce the voltage on the Leyden jar? Uh, yeah, so so Gary, I, I looked at that, uh, but uh, there are two, two things. So the, the, the problem that I found was not the voltage. So the fact that you had a, a, a breakdown of the dielectric material uh, didn't come from the high voltage but it did come from the, 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 the power loss in the dielectric material. So uh, that, that would be one thing. So it wouldn't help uh, in that sense. And then uh, if you have a series uh, capacitor, then you will uh, reduce the capacitive range of your variable capacitor. So it, yes, you could do it, but it doesn't help with the breakdowns and it would reduce your tuning range. Yeah, okay. Did uh, did you go to one place for your materials, or uh, was that stuff you just picked up here and there? Uh, you know, I, I don't see, and I did not see in the presentation a list of uh, materials or sources. No, so so so. Um, uh, I think the most important part is uh, the controller, the Arduino-based controller. So if you would go back to the presentation and look at the link of the controller, uh, there's a list there. Uh, most of the parts uh, you can buy on Amazon. So uh, you can buy an Arduino board. You can buy that uh, driver board on uh, on uh, on Amazon. I believe they're like $8. So it's not like a big expense. And then uh, the 
the the jars. Uh, I bought uh, the the glass jars that I tested with on Amazon, and I bought the uh, the uh, the Teflon jar on on eBay uh, from a Chinese company. Uh, and then uh, my last remark was that uh, I, I I do recommend if you want to experiment with uh, higher power, more than one hundred watts. Uh, to use the uh, the quartz glass uh, jar, but um, I haven't purchased one yet. And uh, just doing my research on the internet, it seems like uh, American companies that you know will give you a good quality product uh, ask a, a pretty steep price. So then the question is, is this competitive against like a vacuum capacitor that you buy or uh, somewhere? Um, but uh, suppose you can get a good deal from a Chinese company, then there's still a question mark about, you know, is it will it be good quality quartz glass? Or like I noticed, uh, especially on eBay, is that they mix their marketing terms between quartz glass and borosilicate uh, glass, which is uh, Pyrex. The, the commercial name is Pyrex glass. So if they mix it, uh, you, you will not know what you get, right? So it's kind of like uh, you need to have, find a reliable source uh, for that. So maybe somebody knows that and then I'll be willing to jump in because <laughs> I think it's worthwhile doing it. Yeah, and uh, probably the same, you know, if it's too good to be true, it, it probably isn't if uh, you're seeing real quartz for, you know, X number of dollars and you're seeing it on eBay or uh, something for a tenth of that price, you wonder if it's yeah. really quartz. So uh, what uh, coax are you using between the jar and the small loop? Uh, uh, sorry, can you repeat that question? Between the jar and the small loop, uh, yeah. what kind of coax are you using? Oh, I, I just use uh, RG58. And it's, uh, it's uh, the, the length of the coupling loop is about 20% of the, the, the big loop. So that is kind of like the default. Uh, there are many articles about magnetic loop antennas that use that kind of uh, measurement, like one fifth of the length of the big loop. And what I also do is uh, I, I make a shielded loop. So I connect the, uh, the inside of the loop at the outside shield. Uh, so part of the loop is shielded and that gives you a little better SWR over the whole frequency range. Okay. Are you uh, thinking of ever, ever publishing your design someplace, like sending it into QST or someplace else or putting it on the yes, web? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking about doing that. Yeah, I, I kind of like I, I have the presentation and I have the story. So it's just a matter of uh, typing it out and sending it in. Okay. <laughs> right around the corner, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Are there uh, any other questions for Rainier? I thought it was an interesting presentation. It's nice to see the uh, Arduino connection as well. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a little something for everybody's software and hardware. Yeah. Well, if, if you, uh, I, I did a presentation for the local group here, and uh, basically most of the people were interested in the damage we could do. <laughs> <laughs> Just like and anything that creates sparks or fire <laughs> that 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 uh, yeah. lights up a lot of interest. But so so saying that uh, there is of course uh, dangers involved with experiments like this or projects like this, especially if you have like jars that get glass jars that get damaged. So I I do think that uh, you need to be careful, uh, protect your eyes when you're doing experiments with this. Uh, because of the high field strengths with antennas like this, you want to keep your distance. So that's why the remote control was really, really needed, uh, especially when you do uh, high power experiments with small antennas. Okay. Uh, if you have a loop on the patio uh, and the patio has a roof, does the roof affect the performance of the loop? and Or would it be better out in the open? And uh, as far as uh, out in the open, I think you might want to talk about the, how narrow the uh, the beam width is on some of these and you know which way you have to turn it to get it to uh, your signal the direction you want yeah yeah well I, I can only refer to the, the theory that that is existing about this so I noticed that uh, uh, the tuning was affected by uh, 
the, the location on the patio because there are so many stuff uh, in the walls and, and on the roof that is nearby. So if you turn the loop, um, it, you do need to return, uh, retune it. Uh, but you know that can be done easily remotely. Um, and then the theory says that you know the advantage of a magnetic loop antenna is that you don't you don't need to place it at a more than a quarter wavelength of height in order to get a, a low radiation angle. Um, I didn't notice uh, a very sharp dip with this antenna, but that could be because there's so many, so much materials around the antenna on the balcony. So uh, it was not that I had to to turn it in order to get a good reception. Uh, usually, uh, I got good reception from uh, from Asia and most of the U.S. using this antenna. So. Um, as far as I, I could test it, uh, given the fact that it was not an, as an ideal location, uh, I would say uh, it, it performed uh, better than I expected. And, and yes, uh, having it uh, at, at a free space would have definitely been uh, a better, better uh, situation. But then again, if you put it on the roof, I, I would think that you need to consider having a rotator as well, because uh, you, you may get better performance if you're able to turn it in the right direction. Then again, I haven't, I, I didn't have any um, adverse effects yet, but I, I think that's what I would do if I would put it on the roof or on a, on a higher location. Okay. Um, we have two questions about construction materials. One is uh, what did you use for your plate material and what kind of stepper motor did you use for the version two loop? Uh, the stepper motor that I used is a standard uh, motor that you can buy on uh, Amazon for about ten dollars. Nothing uh, special so needed there, then. Not nothing special. There's a, a lot of models available. Some uh, I, I use a model that that draws a one amp current, so it's not the uh, the big CNC type project uh, stepper motors, uh, but it's a lighter version, which is more than enough just to move that coil or uh, that plate up and down. And then for the plate material, I used a uh, uh, brass sheet material that I could buy from uh, the local supply store here. Okay. Um, yeah. The brass sheet was about five dollars for the for you know one sheet, and I could cut it in two and and, and use that for the, the capacitor plates. Okay. Uh, did you find that uh, the two hundred and fifty watts was substantially better than one hundred watts? Um, it, it, yeah, yeah, in the sense that, um, <laughs> you know, my, my experience is that, uh, 250 Watts give me, give me more contacts, not necessarily always with better or higher signal levels, uh, because that's more pro propagation driven, but I do have the experience that if I run 250 Watts, I get more contacts in an hour than when I run uh, barefoot 100 watts. Okay. Uh, question about uh, putting two laden gears driven in parallel, uh, which probably uh, the law of uh, squares makes it four times harder to uh, get everything right at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what you would get out of doing that. Well, it, it's it's easier because you have the stepper motor and assuming that the stepper motors don't skip steps, it's easy to uh, have uh, multiple capacitors run synchron uh, in synchronous in a synchronous way. Mm -hmm. So um, I can imagine that you do that. Uh, that would also uh, distribute the power over the two capacitors and would help with the dissipation uh, of the power loss. So, uh, yeah, if okay. you run it in. Yeah, so mechanically it would be uh, harder to do, um, especially because you need to connect the loop ends to both uh, both antenna, uh, both capacitors. Um, so, the, so the magnetic loop is basically a single coil uh, loop, and then the ends of the loop are being connected to both plates. So that's the only thing that you know, might might cause you some uh, mechanical uh, problems to solve. Okay. 
Uh, Bob asked if bigger would give you more capacitance or does it have an impact on thermal issue? But I don't know uh, a bigger what. <laughs> So Bob, yeah, bigger, you type that yeah. in or whatever. No, so so I think bigger is is better in this case because the thing is that um, the problem where where the, the capacitor breaks is where you have a lot of power being transferred through the, the dielectric material uh, through a very small area. So if you can increase that area some way, that always helps. So uh, if, if you are uh, having two capacitor plates that are barely uh, overlapping, then having a, a longer uh, diameter of the capacitor will definitely help uh, increase the area or the volume of the dielectric material. And um, so if you can uh, increase the, 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 the volume with a factor of two, then the temperature will drop with a factor of two as well, uh, which is, you know, could be the difference between failure and, and success. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I had heard about uh, mag loop antennas are the voltages at the feed point. Uh, is this something that you need to keep away from where people could accidentally come into contact with it or something while you're transmitting? Um, yeah, well, I I would say in general, uh, magnetic loop antennas uh, work with, with very high currents, very high voltages. Um, so it's always a good... Um, good idea to keep people away from a working antenna uh, yeah. so that's one um, the voltages are are pretty high uh, like um, 250 watts easily creates 10 kilovolts at the end of the loop so uh, you want to keep keep uh, keep people away from that yes yeah okay very good is there anything else for right now? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. We'll uh, stay for another moment or two, but uh, I found it interesting. Thank you very much. And something to talk about uh, uh, with the guys at the club. I was uh, talking to Rainier ahead of time, and we have a few people building uh, mag loop antennas at our club. So it's another way to do it instead of buying that very expensive uh, vacuum capacitor. Yeah, and I, I must say that uh, I you know my, my base station uses uh, an NFET uh, antenna uh, for 10 and 80 meters, so it's uh, 130 foot long. Uh, this is much smaller, but I, I did get similar results on uh, on 21 and 28 megahertz. Um, so I could work DX with it uh, without expecting it to be honest. But uh, you know, first first night after building it, I was able to get. Uh, uh, contacts with Indonesia and Australia um, and that was uh, during um, uh, the field day weekend when the propagation was not that great uh, so uh, I was happy with the results very good anything else you'd like to uh, finish up with right now um, no I I think people can reach out to me if they have questions or uh, a good point uh, is your uh, email address on uh, QR is that uh, good or um yes yes that see, I'm, okay i'm looking at uh the slides from your uh presentation and uh there's nothing there with an email address but they can reach out to you if they need anything yes yeah okay all right well thank sure. you very much i'm going to end the stream and uh thank you very much take care okay yeah. thank you don thanks for hosting yeah.